Okay. So we've had a look at the past and we want to think about the future. So let's just briefly take a look at a couple of examples from the present on our way from the past to the future. We might ask, okay, there's a lot of evidence that species have moved as climate change in the past, but we know that human-induced climate change is already occurring, so shouldn't we be seeing changes that are happening because of, of human climate change? And the answer to that question is yes, we are seeing changes um, due to human climate change. And let's take a look, and some of them are very dramatic and are occurring over incredibly large scales. So let's just look at two of those quickly, just so we can r answer the question, is climate change already affecting species? So one system I want to talk about, because it, it's undergoing some really interesting changes, is the Bering Sea. The Bering Sea is an area just around the junction between the United States and Russia. So you got a kind of picture, here's the North Pole. So we're going to a high latitude because the high latitudes are changing very rapidly. So we're going to high latitudes for one example. And so here's the North Pole. Here's the Bering Sea here, basically between China and Russia. So picture, if you can, this is the top half of Canada, this is Alaska, and this is Russia coming over here, okay? Um, and this, this chart shows that sea ice changes between summer and winter in this area, but the purple area indicates historical sea ice area, the white is current sea ice, so you can see that sea ice is retreating a lot due to warming. And that retreat of sea ice is affecting species that depend on sea ice, namely walrus and spectacled eider, both of which are species that rest on sea ice and then dive down to eat clams on the bottom of the ocean. So these are species that are in super cold water. They're expending a lot of energy to get their food because they're diving down to the bottom of the ocean to eat clams. The walruses dig up the bottom of the ocean with their big tusks and then they eat the clams and the eiders go down and eat individual clams. So kind of ironically, um, one of the ways these two species stay warm is by resting on ice. So resting on ice wouldn't seem like a great strategy for getting warm, but it turns out that, as you may know, when you're in cold water, you lose heat a lot more rapidly than when you're in cold air. And in their case, one way to get out of the water and into air is to sit on ice. Well, the, the water's very cold, the ice is only 32 degrees, and the air is a little bit warmer. So they can stay warm much more easily by being in air, which doesn't conduct heat so rapidly. If they uh, sit in water, then they're losing heat much faster, and they've got to eat a lot more just to maintain their metabolism to, uh, to resist that cold water. So, as, so then we have a look at those two species. Let's look at walrus again, because they're <laughs> so cool. And the spectacled eider are pretty spectacular themselves. But let's look at what happens to them. So here's the historical situation where both walrus and spectacled eider can sit <laughs> on ice. Uh, the Bering Sea, where they are, is actually a continental shelf area, so it's a little bit shallower than the deep ocean on either side, the Arctic Sea or the Pacific. Uh, and so these species are able to dive down and eat clams on the bottom safely. But what's happening now is, as we <laughs> saw in that satellite image, the sea ice is retreating, so they don't have as much ice to sit on, which means they wind up sitting in water, cold water, losing temperature, and then diving down to eat clams that are becoming less abundant um, because fish are moving into this area for the first time. In in the historical condition, there was cold water that would sit right at the edge of this shelf that kept fish from moving in and eating clams, which is why there are so many clams here. As waters have warmed, the fish are now moving onto the continental shelf and eating a lot of clams, so the walrus and eider are stuck sitting in water, having to dive deeper and deeper and getting fewer and fewer clams. 
And so, as you can imagine, that's not a very happy recipe for their populations. And both walrus and spectacle lighter have seen big population crashes because they're not getting as much food and they're getting farther and farther away from their food source if they want to rest on ice. Uh, a further complication is that fishing boats follow the fish into this area and destroy bottom habitat, which means there are even fewer clams. So it's a deteriorating condition for both walrus and spectacled eider. And this is what happens when you have walrus that have no ice to rest on. And then they wind up trying to find places on land that they can forage from and this was a uh, year before last when they had an incredible congregation of walrus on one beach uh, in which there were 40 or 50,000 walrus all crammed together on this one beach uh, because their ice habitat wasn't available in the time of year that it usually is. So here's one system where, you know, things are warming. When it warms, ice melts. Uh, that changes the ecology for both of these species a lot um, and it's changing their food availability as well and so we're seeing declines, big declines, in both of these species. Let's go a little farther south in British Columbia. This critter, the mountain pine beetle, has been attacking trees um, over half a dozen western states in the U.S. in British Columbia uh, hundreds of thousands of square kilometers uh, of trees killed, uh, hundreds of millions of trees dead. And the reason for the attack of the mountain pine beetle is climatic. The mountain pine beetle has a life history in which sometimes uh, pine beetles emerge at different times of the year and they attack trees um, and damage trees but because the, the beetles aren't very ab abundant because they're emerging at different times, um, the trees can resist their attack and the trees aren't killed. But as conditions have warmed, the pine beetles have hit a uh, temperature zone in which they emerge synchronously, which means they all come out at the same time. So you have these huge emergences of uh, these insects and they attack trees all at the same time and the tree's defenses aren't strong enough to hold off these mass uh, attacks and the trees die. And so all these dead tree, all these orange trees as far as you can see are dead trees, and this is British Columbia, but you could take the same photograph in Colorado, other parts of the U.S. You just have um, mass tree mortalities over large areas. And so this is changing the ecology of this system dramatically, and um, if we want to over a beer tonight, we could discuss, well, what, what are conservation strategies when you're faced with deaths of trees over uh, such large areas, sort of essentially entire states in the U.S. Uh, losing a large percentage of their uh, pine trees. Okay, so that's just a couple of examples of dramatic, dramatic changes going on because of climate change already. So we've got plenty of reason to be concerned about the future. So then let's talk a little bit about how we assess the future and how we might uh, look at conservation responses to climate change. So we're going to backtrack a little now. We've already talked a bit about general circulation models, uh, but I just want to go over those basics again. Question? No? No, you're just looking thoughtful. I thought you had a question. <laughs> because I, I don't know yes. <laughs> what these colors refer to, what to indicate what. Yes, I'll, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. <laughs> so, this, uh, I just want to go over the basics of, of how we do climate modeling. Uh, because it's a basic input into assessing how uh, species may respond. If we're doing modeling of species response to climate change, we're always using climate models. So uh, the first thing to know is that the acronym that people always use for global climate models is GCM. But in fact, it doesn't stand for global climate model, although we wish it did. It stands for general circulation model. And that's really just a historic uh, terminology because these, uh, atm these climate models were modeling atmospheric circulation. So they were known as general circulation models. And that acronym, GCM, has stuck. And it happens to correspond to global climate model. But don't 
fall into the trap of saying that GCM stands for Global Climate Model or people will know you're not a real climate person because it really stands for General Circulation Model. Um, this map is just a representation of some temperature projections from GCMs and um, so these shades of yellow to red are increases in temperature uh, above the historic levels, so it's actually from about the year 2000 into the future. And you see the high latitudes have very strong uh, changes in temperature. The tropics have less severe changes in temperature, but still very significant changes in temperature for the tropics especially considering that the uh, annual seasonal variation in the tropics is very muted. So the, the, the temperature increase in the tropics relative to the amount of temperature variation annually that uh, the regions experience is uh, actually even greater than, than the increase at high latitudes relative to interannual and annual variation. So, so yeah. Bilal. Are you going to talk about the different emission scenarios? Uh, I wasn't going to talk a lot. I'm going to talk a little bit about this because this is an older one. Okay. But I don't have a lot about emission scenarios in. Um, but we could ask ourselves, okay, well, what sort of a model produces this kind of a global map of how climate is changing? So let's look quickly at that. These models are set up, they're computer models, right? And they're models of the physical climate and they are essentially made up of a number of uh, layers into the atmosphere and down into the oceans and then gridded across the surface of the planet. So think of it as a whole lot of cubes going down into the ocean and up into the atmosphere so that you can represent um, the entire uh, planet's atmosphere and ocean space uh, together. And then there, uh, there are equations going on in each one of these grid cells regarding how much moisture is coming into the grid cell, what's happening to it in that particular grid cell, and then that information passes into a neighboring grid cell and the model simulates weather actually. Um, but it's run over a very long period of time. So unlike the weather models, which look just, are designed in exactly the same way, these climate models uh, don't, the, when they run these models to look at climate change, they don't save the information about daily weather or annual weather. They save information about longer periods of time. But it works just the same way a weather forecasting model does. And uh, in the initial climate models, they only modeled the atmosphere. So it only sort of gridded up the surface of the planet in sort of, uh, grids that are about to two or three hundred kilometers on a side and then 20 or 30 layers into the atmosphere. But as scientists appreciated the role of the oceans in generating climate, they realized that they also had to model down into the depths of the ocean and so they created models that also had many layers into the ocean to model. Um, so you can see here that this model was built on a grid cell <laughs> that's almost four degrees uh, in one direction and two and a half degrees in, an, in uh, longitude. And the reason for that is the reason we have these three or 400 kilometer size grid cells is because in order to run the whole planet for a hundred years, you need to do it in a pretty coarse way. It would actually be obviously uh, beneficial, more beneficial to have much smaller grid cells so that you could resolve mountains from lowlands and represent climate features in those ways. But if you did that, you'd be running your models for years rather than weeks or months. And so in order to get the run times down to a reasonable <laughs> limit, uh, climate modelers use very large uh, grid cells in their global runs. 